Good afternoon. May I begin by thanking um, President Amina for her insights into what happened in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you very much, Amina. <clears throat> well, welcome to this panel on the roles and responsibilities of governments and international organizations. As we come towards the end of the meeting, this wonderful meeting, we have benefit of much insight and, and wisdom that has flowed through this room. A common thread since yesterday has been this whole issue of trust. <clears throat> so before we begin this discussion, I want to alert you to a report put out on Tuesday this week by the Reuters Institute at Oxford University. It's about people's trust in media and news. There are lessons in this report for us uh, as well. The report states, and I quote, there is no single trust problem and therefore there is no single trust solution. The conference secretariat will forward you the links to this report. My name is Shahid Jamil. I trained as a biochemist and virologist. I worked in academic research for 25 years in India before transitioning into research management and policy, working with the government of India and the Wellcome Trust. I now work at Oxford at the interface of science and society, particularly the role that faith plays in how we respond to contemporary challenges, challenges such as disruptive technologies, climate change, health, and so on. Today, we have two experienced, and if I may say, battle-hardened professionals on this panel. Jerry Parker, at the far end, is a professor and associate dean for One Health at Texas A&M. He chaired the U.S. government's National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, which is affectionately called NSABB. Their recent report has made much news, and Jerry hopes to convince everyone not to be alarmed by their recommendations impeding their work, <clears throat> and also to convince us that biological threats are taken very seriously at the highest levels of government. Trevor uh, Smith is at Global Affairs Canada and comes with years of experience working internationally to reduce the risk of chemical and biological threats. He is a part of the Global Partnership Biological Security Working Group, which recognizes that biological weapons and materials pose a significant and growing threat to global security. <clears throat> Trevor's work in this area has been recognized at the highest levels, such as G7. So let me start off by requesting both panelists for five-minute opening statements. So Jerry, if you could please give us a rundown from Asilomar in 1975 to NSABB in 2023, has planning, in your view, moved from being reactionary to being proactive and preparatory? Over to you. Well, thank you for the question, and, and first, thank you for um, starting this panel discussion off on the theme of trust and um, reestablishing public trust in everything we do, and it's gonna take, I think, all of us have a responsibility uh, to help them build, rebuild that trust in some cases and sustain it. So thank you for starting us off on that. So, um, and first, the short answer to your question, have we moved from reactionary to uh, anticipatory? I think we are still in a reactionary phase, uh, but I hope that we can move into a more anticipatory phase. So I, I'm going to just describe very quickly um, a little bit of the history of the NSABB and, and some of the policies that have happened um, 
uh, since the, really the uh, Selimar Conference in 1975 to the current NSABB report that was just released and actually the policy that's in place uh, that was uh, put in place in 2017 was a P3CO policy. And of course, this is an acronym free zone. So that's the potential pandemic uh, pathogen um, care and oversight framework. Um, so first and foremost, the United States does have a comprehensive biosafety, biosecurity framework in place, but it has evolved in reaction to events since the Asunoro Conference in 1975. And that, to some degree, that's natural. I think a lot of our policies, no matter what the topic, is in response to an incident or, or an event, and we have to be responsive to those incidents. Um, but I anticipate the U.S. government will take another step forward um, soon, now that the NSABB report has been released just last month in 2023. And I, I have to make a comment here that although I'm a member, current member of the NSABB and uh, chair of the NSABB since 20, December of 2019, um, my comments today are my own. They're not rec um, reflective of the board, any government agency, or, or any institution. But the, I do have quite a bit of knowledge about the NSABB since I've been involved with it almost from the very start. I actually remember attending the inaugural meeting in 2005 and was an ex-official member of it as well when I was at HHS. So the NSABB was established in 2005. It was authorized by Congress, and it was, re it was re established in response to the Fink Report at the time. So I know many of you in this room are familiar with the Fink Report, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, and it was, it, was, it was stood up to advise the U.S. government on policies that would be needed to oversee and govern dual-use research in the life science. And the NSABB produced its really a seminal report in just two years from when it was stood up in 2007 that the, really it was a framework for uh, um, governing dual-use research. And some of you in this room were actually worked on that report and um, uh, spent a lot of um, time and thought into that report. But unfortunately, the U.S. government didn't act on that report in 2002-2014. Mm, that's kind of a long delay. And, and actually uh, only did so because it was in reaction to the two influenza papers that have been discussed already at this, this conference. And then, of course, there was, a, there was a rash of serious laboratory biosafety incidents in some of the premier laboratories in the United States in 2014. And the Obama um, White House right, rightfully got so, even those weren't associated with gain-of-function research or concern or do-use research, they were nonetheless concerning. And so uh, the Obama White House imposed a moratorium on gain-of-function research in 2014. The NSABB was called back to work and um, simultaneously to look at policies that would be needed to oversee gain-of-function research. Now, unfortunately, the term gain-of-function was used in that moratorium, and that really caused a lot of confusion. I think we know that, recognize that confusion in retrospect than maybe when it was first used. Uh, but it caused confusion then, and it con continues to cause confusion today. Well, the NSABB worked on that and produced another report in 2016 about governing and overseeing um, gain-of-function research of concern, indicating that the real concern and the issue was a subset, hopefully a very small subset, of research that could potentially generate and enhance potential pandemic pathogen. So what we're really talking about is 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 an enhanced potential pathogen that could be reasonably be anticipated to be highly virulent, highly transmissible, cause significant morbidity and mortality. And, and that, that potentially, if the information from that was misapplied, or if there was an accident, knowingly or unknowingly, that caused a laboratory-acquired infection, that could potentially lead to a pandemic epidemic or community outbreak. And we heard this morning that there are a lot of chain of events that have to happen for, for a pandemic to happen, but it's possible. So the, the goal of the P3CO was to make pre-funding decisions before embarking on research that might reasonably be anticipated to create an enhanced potential pandemic pathogen. So the White House OSTP released guidance in 2017 after the NSB, based on the NSBB 2016 report. Uh, HHS developed a policy, the P3CO, the Potential Pandemic Care and Oversight Framework, in December of 2017. And several people, some in this room, remarked that it 
looks like a fairly reasonable policy, um, and it looks like a good starting point, but we'll see. Uh, and so here we are uh, five years later, and we're seeing. <laughs> so the, um, um, and unfortunately, the 2017 P3CO framework, even though it was a reasonable policy framework at the high level, it wasn't accompanied with implementing direction, implementing guidance, what was expected for the risk-benefit analysis, what were expectations for transparency. So the NSABB was called back once again in February of 2022, and I um, um, still on my tenure as the chair of the, of the NSABB, and, and the, work, the, the NSABB members uh, worked very, very hard over the last 12 months to produce the report that just came out a month ago. I mean, several of us had at least weekly meetings and um, uh, a lot, just a lot of writing and a lot of debating, a lot of arguing <laughs> you know, to, to work through it. But uh, the report was released um, in um, March 2023 and came up with 13 findings and recommendations. And I'm just going to just hi highlight some of the recommendations. So number one was to develop an integrated approach for oversight of research that raises significant biosafety, biosecurity concerns, including EPP and DERC research. And with a goal and a framework, of how, how can we better integrate those two so they're not completely separate. It, it does, the recommendations do uh, recommend to expand the scope of uh, what, what would constitute EPP research. It removes unnecessary blanket exclusion criteria or what, what could be interpreted as blanket exclusion criteria. Importantly, there's a recommendation to enhance institutional responsibility to include articulating specific roles, responsibilities, and expectations across the review continuum from the PI and institution to the funding agency and all the way up to, eight, in this case, HHS or the, or the department level in case something does need to get elevated at the department level for review. And importantly, most importantly, to strengthen and harmonize amplified technical and financial resources for the institutional review committees, and actually even the government committees too. You can't do this without resourcing it. Um, and this is the concept we talked about yesterday. How do you link bottom-up responsibility and top-down um, guidance and regulation? And provide, compromise, provide implementing directives, guidance, standards for risk-benefit analysis, um, and provisions for ongoing oversight. Uh, take steps to increase transparency in the review process, including sharing a summary of key determinants to inform EPP research funding decisions, adopt functional criteria for both DERC and P3CO, no more just list-based, and require adoption and compliance by all federal departments and non-federally -federal, funded EPP research in the United States, and a few others. The NSABB received input from the <coughs> part, federal department agencies, research investigators, institutional compliance, officials familiar with EPP research, national security experts, professional scientific societies, the publishing community, and public comments as well. NIH also hosted a couple uh, stakeholder listening sessions that include scientists, professional societies, and members of the public. I think in the, in the future, though, I would like to see the U.S. government do more targeted outreach to the general public, because the general public may not be as familiar with these issues, may not be as familiar to look at when these announcements come out, and the general public needs a voice in these, these decisions when the outcome of an EPP research or dual use research, if it went awry, will all be affected. So I just a call for more public input. And, um, and as appropriate for a federal advisory board, the, the NSABB re recommendations are what I describe it as strategic, what level of detail, and so the what level essentially sets the outcome standard but the U.S. government now, the interagency, has got a lot of hard work if they decide to adopt these recommendations, which I hope they do. They have a lot of hard work and now to spell out comprehensively the how level of detail in an implementation directive and guidance and so forth. And I think, uh, oh, and most importantly, most, most, most importantly, we must provide resources, both financial and technical. We have to fund biosafety. I'll end there. Thank you very much, Jerry, for really a, a comprehensive rundown. And Trevor, if I may come to you um, and ask you about how you think the 
international security community works uh, towards reducing biological risk, towards improving bio-risk management, uh, and cultivating a culture for safe and responsible research. Thank you, Shahid. Hope is not a strategy. I wish it was, because if it were, my beloved Toronto Maple Leaf ice hockey team wouldn't have broken my heart every year since I was born. <laughs> But there is proof that hoping that something will be won't make it so. The international security views biological threats as hope is not a strategy. So we need one. When it comes to biological threats, they are not just a public health problem. They are not just an animal health problem. And much of our discussion here has been about human health, but there's a critical animal health angle to this with zoonoses that we all recognize and, and must be part of our consideration. And then plant health. If we look back at the long and frightening history of biological weapons development by certain countries, there were dedicated programs to kill crops. Starve a people, starve their animals, you win. So the international security community has long realized it has an essential role to play in the global effort to prevent, detect, and respond to all manner of infectious disease threats, whether they are natural, as the vast, vast majority of infectious disease incidents will be accidental or, in the rare case, deliberate. For more than a century, the international security community has been in this space. We heard yesterday from a colleague from the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs about the really important work of the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, about the UN Secretary General's mechanism. I can't recall if the Geneva Protocol was mentioned, but it goes back even further, a century, and prohibited the, the use of biological agents as a means of war, uh, as, a, uh, as an outcome of the horrors that were witnessed in the First World War. But those were standards. They were norms. They were expectations. And more was needed. And the more became especially apparent following the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, in the United States. We all know that those attacks uh, by commercial aircraft that were hijacked were devastating. How much more devastating would they have been if those terrorists had their hands on nuclear materials, biological, or chemical. Less than a month after the 9-11 terror attacks, we saw what a handful of letters with a few grams of anthrax could do. The cost of that, the terror of that, the economic impact of that. Relatively few people perished. Individual tragedies for every one of those families. But the devastation needs to be measured and recognized beyond those individual lives and what it can do. With this recognition, the group of eight countries at the time, now of course we are G7, recognized that the status quo was not good enough. And at the Kananaskis Summit in Canada in June of 2002, they came together and created what is known as the Global Partnership Against the Spread of Weapons and Materials of Mass Destruction the initiative that I've dedicated my entire professional career to. I won't ask people to raise hands. I don't like participation in group settings. Um, but it would be interesting to know how many of you have heard of the Global Partnership. And I have a sense from conversations I've had, it's not that many of you. And it, it's, it's interesting because the Global Partnership is, is one of the best unknown success stories in the international security community to come along in a very, very long time. Over the past 20 years, our now 31 members, 30 countries plus the European Union, have delivered more than $25 billion in concrete threat reduction programming to prevent terrorists and states of proliferation concern from acquiring biological and other weapons of mass destruction. And back to my somewhat flippant comment at the beginning about hope not being a strategy, we have strategies. To prevent biological threats, we have a set of five deliverables that our member countries agreed. And something I want to stress, and I'll probably return to in, in subsequent comments, is we did not develop these deliverables 
which focus on biosafety and biosecurity, on surveillance, on capacity building. We didn't develop these in isolation. The public health community, the animal health community, were at the table with us from the very beginning and have stayed at the table with us over the long course of our history. So the international security community, uh, Shahid, have a, a critical role to play. And if there's a message that I can deliver here, it would be for partners going forward to view the, the international security community as part of global health security and not a, an outside entity either to be feared or avoided, which too often to this day is the case. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, you raised some, some very pertinent points, and maybe there's one point, if there's time, I'll come back to. And that's the one health point which you referred to, and Jerry, you are, are an expert on that. <clears throat> How do we get people from different sectors talking to each other? We'll come to the end if there is time, but keep that thought with you. <clears throat> so um, let me open uh, the panel to some, some questions from my side, and I'll be grateful if we can re you know, restrict the comments to maybe about two minutes each. So Jerry, the first question to you <clears throat> is uh, about the NSABB recommendations, and there have been several commentaries in reputed journals uh, and elsewhere, uh, which suggest that the recommendations don't have universal support. Some have expressed concern that these recommendations, if adopted, may limit our future pandemic preparedness. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Sure. And, you know, in, in, our, in our day and time, in our, our, our climate, it's not, not uh, unexpected that there's not going to be universal support for almost anything. And it's, it's no surprise that there may not be universal support for these recommendations, but I think there's more support than, than has been reported in, in the Science Nature um, articles. Um, and, and I think one of the things it's important in the NSABB recommendations what, um, and the thought that went into those recommendations was, let's not make policy now based on our institutional capacities to do effective, efficient, timely reviews, that we need to be thinking about the policies that are really <clears throat> needed to answer the charge that we got from NIH and OSDP for looking at, at how well the, the current DERC and P3CO policies are working and what they need to change to so they be, will be more effective in strengthening governance and oversight of EPP and dual use research while minimizing the impact of the scientific enterprise. I mean, that's the goal, much easier said than done. Um, so with that, um, it will take some strengthening of our institutional capacities so that we can achieve the, the timely, effective, efficient reviews starting at the institutional level with the PI and the, and the research compliance office at, at local institutions, as well as the funding agencies are going to have to beef up their technical staff as well. And if, if, if an EPP um, proposal needs to go up to HHS, they're going to need resources as well, or any other federal department level. So this is not resourced in 2017. And, and so I, and I've, I've actually hear from a lot of people, and, and the people I hear actually say, those recommendations are actually pretty good. And those are something that we really need to do. But then, then they also come back, they're concerned about whether the institution will get the resources, whether the IBCs, because the IBCs are already overstretched. And so the issue about resources is very, is very real. And, and does need to be supported. And I, in my opening remarks, I'm, you know, we have to fund biosafety and biosecurity. And if we're going to improve and strengthen oversight of dual-use research of concern and EPP research, we're going to have to resource it with, that wasn't done in the, in the past. And I'll just uh, I'll end with the ASM actually came out with a statement when our when the draft report was released in. January, and there's not that much change from, from the January to the March. It just improved it better. But they actually um, spoke very positively about the recommendations and, and spoke very positively that the NSABB 
through the deliberative process, actually incorporated the ASM, ASM recommendations, concerns, and so forth over, over the year. And they actually urged the administration, the White House, to urgently implement the NSABB recommendations. And they also actually urgent, urged the administration to begin a dialogue internationally and to take on the, the leadership role internationally. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, let me come to you. And from the perspective of global partnerships, what and where do you feel we have the most serious biological threats? It's, it's a very big question, Shahid. Now, I will make it even bigger by saying when. Um, because we're <laughs> often looking to the future and the new technologies that continue to race ahead. I and mean, what does CRISPR mean? Um, you know, the fact that we can, you know, order pathogens online, what does that mean? What does it chat is, GPT mean? It, 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 <laughs> precisely. Big problem. But we, uh, we, we also must look back. Yesterday's biological threats have not left us. We need to focus more attention on the developing world and the disease burden that is so crippling in so many countries around the world. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014 and 15, that has been referenced multiple times, was a terrible public health and human tragedy. It was also one of the largest proliferation events that we have seen in modern times. 300,000 samples of Ebola were taken and left behind, virtually abandoned. I'm not saying this to be critical. I'm saying it as a wake-up call. Biosafety and biosecurity were not a part, to the most part, of the response to the Ebola crisis in 2014-15. I understand that the priority was saving lives, and of course, that's always where it should be. But we shouldn't do that at the expense of future threats and not doing the practical work that needs to be done to integrate effective biosafety and biosecurity. Bring an autoclave. When you're done with the samples, make sure they are cataloged. Instead, what happened is when the public health professionals left, having done heroic work, the international security community got the call. We've got a problem. So our programs through the Global Partnership has, have been working in West Africa for years now, helping our colleagues there not just clean up what was left behind, because that's not enough. What happens the next time? It's building capacity across the health security spectrum and not just dealing the old-fashioned way when we talk about international security, which is guns, gates, and guards. That's not biosecurity. Biosecurity is enabling our partners around the world to have appropriate capabilities in their public health systems, in their animal health systems, to deal with any type of disease that comes their way, to deal with it effectively, to deal with it collaboratively, and from the perspective of the security programs, safely and securely. Thank you. Jerry, let me come back to you again um, and ask you about barriers to adopting more institutional responsibility. Uh, especially through biosafety committees, institutional biosafety committees in the U.S. as well as globally uh, in both high and low income um, settings. And if you could also address why it has taken so long for the U.S. to act on these recommendations uh, and take uh, an international lead leadership role. Sure, and, and um, first on on enhancing institutional, say, biosafety committees in the United States and harmonizing and strengthening um, um, the IBCs in the United States. And I, I, and I will commonly say, how do we elevate the IBC to be on par with our institutional animal use care committees or IRB type committees? They need to be elevated to be on that, that same, same par. So it won't be easy. And again, it's gonna take the resourcing, it's gonna take education, um, uh, both, re both um, uh, financial and technical resources to, to do that. So even in the United States, it's not gonna be easy. And, and of course, it's gonna be uh, more difficult as we think about that in low resource countries. And so I, we're gonna have to, and, 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 and perhaps what works in the US may not work in another country, so we have to think about the, the right mechanisms in every country uh, to achieve, you know, this bottom-up responsibility that, that's coupled with a top-down 
um, guidance, regulation, whatever it may be in different countries. In the United States, it's more guidance than regulation, but that's different in, in different countries. But it's how do you link and marry up the knowledge that our institutions have at the local level and the scientists at the local level. I believe that most best decisions are, are made locally, but some decisions, particularly if you're going to be generating a, a, a uh, there's some experiments, if you're generating an enhanced potential pandemic pathogen that it could affect the world, then that, could, that decision cannot be made lo locally alone, uh, but it should be informed by it. And so we're going to have to maybe work with the cooperative threat reduction and helping some of the institutional capacity building is, is maybe a funding opportunity through CTR and global partnership um, as, as an example as we think about uh, doing that. And as far as I don't really have a good answer of, of why some of the NSABB recommendations haven't been acted on because they're over a decade um, there's some of the first recommendations of the NSABB. I'm looking to, to others that the United States needs to take a leadership role in um, governance of dual-use research concern. And there's been efforts over the years to do that. It just hadn't been a sustained effort. You know, I would say the global health security agenda incorporated biosafety and biosecurity is part of that. But a very focused on the dual-use research concern. It's just been fits and starts. But I'm hoping this is a renaissance in bios, biosafety. Um, that we're going through, and hopefully it'll be sustained going forward. That's great. I mean, I, I think it'll be very useful if this sort of partnership uh, comes along. Um, so, Trevor, um, about the biological threat uh, reduction work that your group does in developing countries, uh, what lessons have you learned from these efforts? Uh, too many to list here, but, but the most important one is one size does not fit all. Um, and nor does hit and run training do anyone any good. Showing up in a country, providing a week's worth of training, and then saying good luck is not capacity building. I don't want to call it tourism, but it, it's certainly not <laughs> providing the country what they need. Uh, there needs to be more listening, less talking from the perspective of donors as work, as work begins. Um, we've learned this over the past 20 odd years in some of the most effective collaborations that we've developed. We have a new signature initiative to mitigate biological threats in Africa that we have done in the absolute closest cooperation with the Centers for Disease Control in Africa. They are a formal dialogue partner. With our ASEAN partners, we have a program to mitigate biological threats. There are many other examples. And the important part, again, was going in and, and seeing what their perspectives were, what their priorities were, as opposed to saying, we're here to save the day. They don't want to be saved. They want to be supported to do what they need to be done. The other thing I would say uh, briefly, uh, Shahid, that's very important, is to recognize that many of the solutions that were developed in Western countries, for Western countries, will not and cannot work in developing countries. We've heard some commentary in the last day and a half about challenges with laboratories in low resource environments. This has been an Achilles heel of the global partnership for many years. We've struggled terribly with this. What do you do when you have countries that have no functioning um, capacity to safely store, secure, and work on high consequence pathogens of security concern, of human concern, of animal concern? Do you let them continue to work in these abysmal conditions without the appropriate measures, or do we provide a, a technological solution, a laboratory, that we know is going to fail? Because it can't be maintained, it can't be sustained, there isn't the power, the water, the funding. And I say it can't because we've tried and they failed. So we're working now on a new grand challenge for sustainable labs. It was launched about a month ago in collaboration with the World Organization for Animal Health, it's a, a building on more than a decade of work by the global partnership in this space. We are trying, we're putting out an appeal to global innovators. Help us build a better lab, a more efficient laboratory that is going to work in low resource environments, that is going to be operable, that is not going to cripple the governments, and that is going to be an asset and save lives, not an albatross. You know, your comment about a one-week workshop is not training, but tourism uh, <laughs> brings, brings back memories of uh, the late 1980s when 
I was starting my career as a virologist in India. We used to have a term called suitcase research. <laughs> More about that <laughs> later. <laughs> uh, Jerry, let me come back to you and ask you about how does the NSABB deal with dual use uh, research of concern and EPPP uh, research policy? Sure, and um, uh, well, well, let me let me first uh, answer the question about maybe what the NSABB can do and cannot do. And so, NSABB only makes policy recommend or policy option recommendations. It's the, it's the our federal government's going to have to turn those decide which recommendations they want to adopt and then implement and make policy. So we're just a the NSABB is just, just policy option recommendations. But in, in this most recent report, it does describe, in fact, the first recommendation does describe um, a framework for considering how to better integrate the DERC and EPP uh, research. And that actually, it begins with not a list-based pathogen toxin, but it begins with the seven experimental concerns ought to be the first question asked when a, a, something is being proposed. And, and then if, if one of those questions is relevant to the proposed research, then have a discussion. You know, have the PI and the local institutional bodies you know, have a discussion about it. Is this going to be something that's going to raise security and safety concerns or not? If it is, well, we need, you know, a little bit more. Let's take a look at it. Maybe the federal funding agency or other funding agency needs to look a little harder. And if it then elevates to being, you know, need, need to elevate for a higher review, so be it. Uh, but the review process needs to be effective, efficient, and timely along that whole, whole continuum. So the bottom line is the NSABB wanted to, to begin to move to integrate those two concepts, starting out with asking the, the seven questions first. And I think beyond just this current charge that the NSABB received, um, I, I'm hoping that the U.S. government will now also take a look at the whole entirety of the bio-risk management framework. Because as I mentioned in my opening remarks, it has evolved over the last, since 1975, in a, in a rational, reasonable, and, and good, good way. But maybe it's time to look at the, holistically at that whole framework. And where does DERC EPP fit in that whole framework in a more integrated fashion? And, and the federal select agent program is, is one too that, that probably needs to um, a, re a review and analysis for what worked there, what's not working. And, and so I'm hoping that the U.S. government, the administration, will also do a comprehensive um, reevaluation uh, to look for opportunities for strengthening and improving and, um, and efficiency in the whole process. So it really <coughs> comes down to capacity with institutions, capacity with regulators, with funding agencies. Um, and the journals. Uh, and journalists everyone. and also knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot yeah. of our scientists are not knowledgeable about DERC and EPP right. yet. You know, despite we've been talking about these issues for quite some time, it's been a, kind of a smaller subset of our scientific enterprise that's been familiar with it. So we also need to do a better job of making sure that the knowledge is, um, is distri more distributed because you never know when somebody's going to be thinking about an experiment. They may not realize this might actually pose up to that L that it needs a conversation about, whether it meets a DERC or EPP type um, uh, yeah. review. Yeah. Trevor, coming to you on dual re use research of concern, um, can you cite any specific collaborations um, mm. at the health security interface uh, that have meaningfully addressed this? Thank you, Shahid, and, and thank you to colleagues yesterday who already spoke of many of the, the collaborations that Global Affairs Canada has supported as part of our contributions to the global partnership. And there's a long list of other contributions that have been made by the other 30 countries. Um, we talked about the uh, global guidance framework that the WHO has developed, a fabulous new document fully funded by the international security sector. The WHO has revised uh, bio, bio risk manual, funded by the Global Partnership. Work being done by the International Federation of Biosafety Associations. Work being done by the World Organization for Animal Health, such as the recent Global Emergency Management Conference. Fully funded by the international security community. Now, I don't say this as a boast. I'll say it as a bit of a complaint. 
Where are the health partners? Where are the health partners in funding this critical work to deal with dual-use research of concern? And where is the receptivity to reach out to a broader community? Law enforcement. Law enforcement has an absolutely critical role, and I'm going to ask our colleagues to play in a moment a very short video that we have developed in partnership with Interpol. Interpol has an absolutely extraordinarily important role to play when it comes to dual-use research and concern and mitigating biological threats. And hopefully this clip will provide some insight into that. Despite biotechnology being one of the greatest advances in protecting population health and livelihoods, it can be a double-edged sword. It's important to ask ourselves, what happens when biotechnology is harnessed to instill fear or cause harm? Ordinary individuals, terrorist groups and criminals have the potential to misuse biological agents and equipment and release disease into a population, either intentionally or accidentally. When we think about protecting biological agents, we often think about limiting or securing their access. While this part of the issue is more widely discussed and easier to understand, awareness of the challenges of dual-use equipment in the field of biology is slightly more complex. There's 14 more minutes of that video. <laughs> we don't have time, but it speaks to the point. We need to think bigger when we're thinking about dual-use research of concern. It's not just those who have their hands on the materials in the labs. There are far, far many other sectors that are implicated. Thank you. I'll come to the last set of questions, uh, both of you, to, to Jerry first. Um, what are the next steps for the NSABB report? Sure. So the NSABB report, the, uh, the, uh, the, the charge of the NSABB has been completed. The, the report has been finalized. It's been submitted by NIH to the Department of Health and Human Services, and, and the department is forwarded to the White House. My, my hope is, and my anticipation is, and I'm fully pretty confident that will happen, that the White House will establish a policy coordinating committee, and it probably has already started, I'm just not aware of it, um, to look at um, strengthening um, actually many areas in biosafety and biosecurity, but then specifically the P3CO framework and, and the DERC policies, and, and hopefully they will be informed by the NSABB uh, recommend findings and recommendations. That's why we were asked to do the, the hard work over the last year. So I suspect there already is a policy process underway, but I don't know that for sure. And that may take some time. Maybe they'll um, pro provide some interim recommendation. I just don't know. Uh, I've tried to find out, but I, I do not have any uh, com confirmed information I can share on that. And that's really their role to, to share that information anyway. Um, but um, in addition to the administration, Congress has some ideas too. The United States Congress has ideas. And we had a conversation yesterday about regulation, guidance, and so forth. I really, really, really hope and I really, really urge the administration to act on these recommendations rapidly. Um, they may not and we may not necessarily like some of the legislation that could come out of Congress that may not be as informed with the NSABB recommendations. Maybe they will be, but, um, but my, my real desire that the, the administration and Congress can work together um, to come out with policies that are, that are um, meaningful, that will strengthen appropriately governance of dual-use research concern and EPP research while not stifling in, in, uh, scientific enterprise and provide the resources that I talked about that are going to be needed for the, from the institutional level in, in, into the federal government to, to um, govern um, and oversee this type of research and to make sure that re reviews are timely, efficient, and effective. So do you think there's a good chance of that happening before election fever takes over? Uh, it better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, not a <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I mean, I've, I've heard that they are taking it very seriously. And another thing that I know why they're, they're taking it seriously, because of that, the National Biodefense Strategy that was released in October 2022, really for the t first time, has, has a, a section 
pretty significant section on biosafety and biosecurity, including laboratory biosafety and biosecurity and bio-risk management. Past, past national biodefense strategies didn't have that much detail regarding the, um, uh, these issues. So that's a good indication. It will be taken seriously. Uh, I would like to give them a, a, a suspense that they should have a comprehensive policy release in six months. All right. Finally, Trevor, um, what is the current state of global health security cooperation in your view? Now I'm going to speak frankly. I always do. <laughs> uh, it's a slogan. Hmm. Global health security is a slogan if we think of it in the way that it was meant to be in, for example, the Global Health Security Agenda, which when that was drafted in 2014 and brought together truly a global health security community from across all sectors, was to prevent, detect, and respond to all manner of biological threats, whether they be natural, accidental, or deliberate in origin. That's not the GHSA today. And I don't want to say the international security community has been pushed out but we've certainly been pushed aside as people felt more comfortable wearing their old shoes. I'm used to working with people in these sectors. It's hard to work with people over there. So the silos that were meant to be torn down have gone back up. There was a move a couple years ago in the United Nations, in fact. A number of countries put forward a proposal that we shouldn't use the, word, the term global health security anymore. We should change it to global health solidarity because there's no place for security in global health. I beg to differ. And I think COVID has taught us many things. I'm not sure we learned a lot, but we were certainly taught lessons. And disease affects everything. And it affects every sector. And we simply cannot afford not to have functioning global health security. Our populations will not forgive us for not working across the hallways in our own governments with other agencies who are committed to the same objectives. I applaud the, the bulletin of the atomic scientists for the, the crowd that has been assembled here, the expertise from a truly multi-sectoral group. We need more of this. And I'll make an appeal to our colleagues from the public health and the animal health community. The global partnership table includes all of our health security partners, the WHO, WOA, FAO, uh, IFPA, I could go on and on, our primary partners our public health agencies, our, our veterinary institutions. So the international security community includes public and animal health. I challenge you to name me equivalent tables on the animal health and public health uh, sides that include international security. Thank you. This, this is probably a good time to just go back to this question of one health. And, you know, the public health, animal health, and environmental health, these sectors. Um, in, in many countries where it matters, they are handled by different ministries, they don't talk to each other, and it percolates down. Uh, animal health people have no idea about what's happening in human health, and vice versa. So quick comments from both of you on that, and Jerry, you go Sure, first. yeah, we've somehow we've got to figure out the, how to crack the code, so to speak, in, in um, building bridges between our cylinders of excellence. That's silos, but we, because these are cylinders of excellence in health or security, law enforcement, intelligence, and science. We, we, we've got to figure out how to, to, to work across, say, ministries, um, we have to work as, as a multidisciplinary, and I agree with Trevor. I want to really acknowledge the bulletin for bringing such a multidisciplinary um, uh, expertise uh, to talk about these issues, and including journalists who are going to write about this, these issues and tell the story. It's so important. Um, so we, 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 we've, we've got to figure it out. What I've done, though, in the interim, because um, some things you can solve, some things you cannot, and I, I think about One Health as an approach and a philosophy and uh, whatever the problem is, but I think about One Health and I tell my you know, students that I interact with and other colleagues that are inter interacting, at the end of the day, One Health is figuring out how to work with the right disciplines, multidisciplines, to work on the hard global and local challenges together. And you gotta sometimes just do it 
irrespective of the bureaucratic hurdles that are in front of us. And so you just have to have will and build your coalition of the willing and able and do it. Kevin? What he said. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-sectoralism is hard, but it's not that hard. Look at the problems that, you know, the, the, I'll, I'll speak to the scientists in the room here. The work you do in your labs is mind-bogglingly hard. Putting people into space, which we seem to be doing every other day now, that's hard. Picking up a phone or having a chat group with people from another sector, it's not that difficult. It takes discipline, and it takes intent, and it, t it takes a willingness to look beyond narrow views of what individual responsibilities are. Anyone who's working in public health and animal health in health security writ large cannot be an island. You know, at minimum, you're an archipelago, but, but you know, all of these things are connected. And when a disease outbreak happens, and I've seen this time and time and time again, and people are desperately trying to find somebody's phone number, that's not the time to be introducing yourself to colleagues, whether it's the border police, whether it's people at the airports, at the infectious disease lab. Multi-sectoralism needs to start um, long before there's a problem, and it needs to be built deliberately. Much as my comment ab about hit-and-run training, um, it can't be a hit-and-run thing. Okay, well, we met with them. That was nice. No, it has to be a community, a, practi a practicing community. The successes that we have seen in building global health security over the past 20 years through the global partnership, forgive another reference to the global partnership, is because we've kept at it and because we're stubborn and don't take no for an answer. All right. Um, we have about 15 more minutes, so let me open it to questions at the back. So, Trevor, you've said a couple of things which are very close to my heart, so thank you. Um, training can't be hit and run. I've been so fortunate to uh, spend now eight years going back to Pakistan time and time again. I've trained a lot of people, but the great thing that's happened in Pakistan is that they themselves, based on our training, have trained many, many more people than I have. So what the goal of sustained en engagement can, can achieve is not just to build the capacity locally to know about these issues and to do biosafety in the labs, but to do their own training and their own research into biosafety issues that are local to them. For example, one question I had from uh, a participant from Quetta, which is in the desert west of Pakistan, is how much water do I need to wash my hands properly? It's not a question we ask in the West. We don't have that problem. But it's also an issue that they can do the research on themselves so long as they're asking the right questions and have the confidence to do it. And I think that's one thing we can give them is the confidence to do their own research. The other thing I, I, I loved about what you said is uh, this focus on the abandoned uh, bio-waste at the end of a project. I think we need to concentrate more on a whole-of-life cycle approach to biosafety and biosecurity. Mm -hmm. And we may do that in the West, but I don't think our engagement activities have really focused on that sufficiently in the international sphere. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, and really what you describe, it's more than tra it's education. Well, you, you're providing an education foundation that allows them to go you know, do the train the trainer, but it's an education. And I, th and I, think, I think our funding agencies <laughs> need, need to think more about uh, how do we build the educational capacities, including graduate degree training program or education uh, programs in our, in our international collaborations, because that's going to be sustaining. Unfortunately, I know the U.S. is too short-sighted. Uh, I'm be critical of my own country, but we are. USAID for International Development does tons of training, and it's necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, Tim, the whole of life cycle uh, element is critical, and it is at the core of the mission of the global partnership community. When we approached Africa CDC a number of years ago, 
about establishing this new signature initiative to mitigate biological threats in Africa. Um, it was with this premise that we need to build biosafety and biosecurity, disease surveillance, into every aspect of operations, as opposed to it being a parasite, if you will, that attaches itself. Um, and we take that very seriously. And part of that is building up local capacities, and not just building a lab or giving some equipment. Example, in Kenya right now, in collaboration with our very good friends at the International Federation of Biosafety Associations, we launched a new degree program in biosafety and biosecurity at the Masinde Muliro University of Science and Technology. Um, members of the Global Partnership are currently established, are supporting the operationalization of a new uh, biosafety and biosecurity training center at, in South Africa at the Nigeria Institutes of, or excuse me, the National Institutes of Communicable Diseases. Just a couple of examples about trying to build sustainable capacity in a way that is going to create the next generation of experts as opposed to a short-term group of people. Please. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Aurelia Tal John Kwok of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Um, thank you both for a great, great session. Obviously, the um, NSABB recommendations are very US focused. So my question is for both of you. Um, how can the international community, what are, what are concrete steps that the international community can take to push forward on policy you know, uh, related to DERC and EPPP? Um, and also, um, going back to the US, what, what should the US government do or, um, to engage further on international, international regulations on these, these issues? Thank yeah. you. No, that's a great, que a great question. And, and yes, they are. They are U.S. focused because that was the charge of the NS NSABB, and, and I would say that we need to get our own house in order first before we can serve as a leader on the international stage, but hopefully we'll, our, our, we will get our house in order so that we will have a more effective voice. Not that we can, we can provide leadership now, but we will have a more effective voice once we um, update our policies. But then, then, then it's going to we'll take a lot of listening and a lot of dialogue, and we have to use multiple forums because one, um, one approach is not going to work the same for every country. But I think there's some principles in the NSABB recommendations that can uh, uh, have broad applications. It's just how are they implemented in different countries is what we'll have to think through. And the countries are going to have to think through. We can't, you know, just, you know, for it. And we, we, have, we have to help them think through what works. And, you know, there's efforts underway. I know, I know there's a group at the State Department right now working with ABSA and some of, you know, international biosafety type things. Some of it's even in the agricultural space, too, which I'm really happy to, to hear. So we're just going to have to work multiple uh, fronts. It's going to be a d diplomacy, uh, essentially, uh, and work with multilateral organizations, work with funding organizations like the Global Partnership. And, um, but it, it's just, we're, we're just going to have to do it. You know, it's, we're just going to build our coalitions of the willing and able and do it. So we'll take one question here. Uh, and, oh, well, you have the mic there. So go ahead, Jesse. Your question and then your so, question so. and we'll answer together. Okay, uh, my question was for Jerry, and one of the things that you had referred to a little bit uh, during the process of the NSABB is, you know, researchers sometimes are often having sort of low awareness and having not given much thought to Dirk and, you know, maybe not being that supportive or just not caring that much. And I guess what are your, what are your sort of thoughts on beyond the actual regulations having gone through this process? How do you make researchers think and care more about these issues? Well, you know, that's a great, a great question, and, and, and I think there's probably some lessons learned for us as a community when the DERC policy was rolled out in 2014. Because when the DERC policy was rolled out, there was a little bit more of a fanfare with that rollout, and there was companion guidance, and there was education, and there was some webinars, or I don't know if it was webinars, but there was, you know, something happened to try to at least educate, you know, part of the community. It was kind of short-lived, about a year, because also the DERC was given like a year before uh, it was announced in 2014, and everybody was given a year before it was actually truly implemented. So we need to do something very similar for, for the P3CO and DERC, and we think about uh, combining. But I, I think one of the rationales, too, with the first recommendation in, in the NSABB report was this framework of thinking about DERC and P3CO together. And the first question to ask is, is, this, is, is my study potentially going to fall into one of those seven categories of experiments of concern? Yes, no. And if it's yes, then we have to have a dialogue. But I think if we have, the more we have 
our investigators across the world thinking about that, you know, that we, you know, one of the first things is, our, is my research going to maybe bleed into one of those questions and we have to have a dialogue. And I think the more that people are starting with that in mind, then I think, you know, it, 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 the goal was to help disseminate that thinking, you know, from the very start. And, and one of the NIH listening sessions, sessions that we did, it was in the June, July session last summer, um, there was an institution that does that. You know, so some of that was inspired by one of the universities that actually does that already. Please go ahead, and then there is a question at the back over there. Thank you. Um, so my name's Jess Rogers. I'm a non-proliferation lawyer and current impact fellow at the Federation of American Scientists. Uh, question for you, Trevor. So five years ago, the Global Partnership decided that one of its priorities for the next couple of years would be to strengthen national and international capabilities to rapidly identify, confirm, and respond to bioattacks. What kind of processes have been put in place since then, and how can these use beyond um, deliberate attacks? Thank you for mentioning that, and you put a big smile on my face because um, that was something that was put forward during Canada's G7 presidency in 2018. And it was based on a meeting that we had held in Italy in 2017, where we brought together colleagues from all of the international organizations that would be involved in an attack. And we asked a question to each and every one of them, and some of them are sitting in this room. Phone rings. Country says, we've been attacked, send help, what do you do? All of them said, well, I'm not going to say what they said, it was rude, <laughs> but it wasn't good. So there has been a sustained effort to build these mechanisms, and I would say across the board, we've made fabulous progress. The United Nations Secretary General's mechanism has gone from a name on a piece of paper to something that is getting close to operational with fabulous support from Switzerland, which leads the Friends of the SGM group. Germany held a capstone exercise last uh, October in Berlin to test the capabilities. Canada has created standard operating procedures. We're still not there, but we're far further along. WHO now has a dedicated unit funded by members of the Global Partnership that looks at deliberate biological threats. The World Organization for Animal Health has a dedicated biological threat reduction program. Interpol has come to the table and is leading together with WOA and FAO a major project on agrocrime and agroterrorism. So compared to 2018, we are leaps and bounds away uh, better than we were. We're still far from the finish line of where we need to be. So I can assure you that there are continued investments, continued strategies to get us to where we must be um, because we don't know when that phone's going to ring. Okay, so that will be the last question, please. Go ahead. Oh, yes, um, this is for, for Trevor. Um, so in the different sessions, some of the different sessions and speakers have, have talked about the, how the pandemic has revealed that we're in a, working in a very challenging information environment. And unfortunately, that very much applies in sort of some of the, the work that, that you all deal with um, in the sense that with, you know, without going into details or naming names, um, that there is a coordinated, high-level, government-driven, deliberate disinformation effort targeting um, the exact type of assistance uh, efforts that uh, you work on on a daily basis. And so, again, without necessarily going to the specifics of what those, that disinformation is or who's put it out there, I guess I'm interested in your take on, one, um, the risk that that poses how you see it, the, the risk that kind of disinformation campaigns pose, um, to what extent you think that they've been effective or not, uh, and then a message you might deliver to this group in terms of the role that uh, anyone in this room can play in terms of helping to push back on those things. Thank you. Dan, thank you, and I'm glad you raised that because it was, I did want to get to disinformation because massive problem. Those of you who work in public health, I mean, Vaccine hesitancy, disinformation about vaccines, and so many other things. The international threat reduction community is relentlessly targeted by disinformation. 
program that I led in the Kyrgyz Republic many years ago. We were going to build a new laboratory for human and animal health based on the Canadian Science Centre, which combines both human and animal health in one facility. After five years of effort in great collaboration with the Kyrgyz government, it was targeted by an external disinformation campaign, and we were forced to terminate. Uh, there's a detailed working paper that was prepared uh, for the BTWC because Last fall, the BTWC had to convene a meeting because the Russian Federation made allegations that the United States was developing biological weapons in Ukraine. I will say with 100% confidence, that's crap. There, you know, it, it, but it just it speaks to the power of saying something that is not true and how do you stop it? We don't have an answer yet. Um, I'm very grateful to Philip Alensos and the team at King's College who worked with us to develop bioweapons disinformation monitor that was specifically about looking at those, those incidents in Ukraine and trying to provide positive information. As a global health security community, we need to do a better job, though, anticipating disinformation and not playing whack-a-mole. Every time say some, something wrong, we feel we have to defend it and somehow disprove it. It's a losing game. We need to get ahead of it. So there's an effort underway right now within the G7. Uh, Canada is coordinating that is bringing together both the global partnership community on the weapons of mass destruction side and those responsible for disinformation under the rapid response mechanism to try to come up with a longer term vision of what a disinformation counter strategy can look like because we're going to need one. All right, um, so this is the end of the session. Uh, thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Trevor, and thank you, the audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>